Hello all, thank you for joining this live stream. Thank you so much for attending. Um, my name is James and I'm the product expert for Affinity Photo. That basically means I look after the app in terms of uh, learning materials, demo, training, and much more. I'm also an avid photographer. And recently, if I just scroll down, uh, earlier this year, I started to get into astrophotography. Now, previously, I'd kind of uh, dabbled a little bit in terms of Polaris star tracking, that type of thing, um, and that was fairly rudimentary. But at the start of this year, I got a, an equatorial mount and a star tracker, and I started to experiment with stacking long exposures of deep sky objects. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at a workflow that I've developed in Affinity Photo, to process uh, images from, in this case, Deep Sky Stacker. If you're an astrophotographer yourself, you'll probably be aware there's various software to actually stack your raw images and apply your calibration frames. I'm using Deep Sky Stacker as I find it fairly intuitive. And what this is, is the Orion Nebula and the Running Man above it, although you can't actually see the Running Man yet, will tease the detail out as part of the editing process. And um, I've saved it as a 32-bit rational TIFF file. Now, 32-bit is important because it gives us extra precision, which is really, really, really necessary when we're um, tone stretching very sort of um, underexposed astrophotography images. Uh, it helps avoid banding and other artifacting and that type of uh, unpleasantness that we see in our images. So what I've done here then is you can see an affinity photo. We're working in 32 bit at the moment. This is quite important because essentially, apart from one single step, we're going to be working in 32 bit for our entire workflow. And if you've used other software to edit your astrophotography images, you'll know that's quite unique. So let's start then. First of all, I'm going to add a simple curves adjustment to push the overall exposure up or the overall gamma up. And I'm going to use my shortcut for that, so Command M. Okay, and on my curves dialog here, I'm just going to add a, a node round about here, push those tones up. And um, you'll find this on uh, lots of deep sky objects, actually. Um, the Orion Nebula has the Orion core, which is very easy to blow out or overexpose. So what I want to do here is just add another node and kind of tail off that curve there so that we don't end up, you can see what's happening here, so that we don't end up clipping those tones too early on in our tone stretching process. So I'm going to move them down here, like so. Okay, and then I'm going to add, essentially my process is a little, uh, it's a little rough around the edges, but it essentially involves stacking lots of curves adjustments together for the initial tone stretching process. So another curves adjustment. And um, this is another technique that I've recently started using. Um, I must admit, for all other genres of photography, I've never ever used the picker on the curves dialog, but it's incredibly useful for this type of imagery. So I'm going to enable the picker here, and I'm going to sample from the background. You can see I've just clicked there. And then I'm also going to sample from the very faint nebula detail here. Okay, that's going to let me push these tones up gradually. But of course, for each curves adjustment, I do want to kind of add another node and make sure again that we're not blowing out that core detail too early on in the process. Okay, so uh, the other issue that we're going to have <laughs> moving forward with this image is it's incredibly red. And the reason for that is that I shot with a full spectrum camera I had a, an ultraviolet and infrared cut filter on. Um, but in Deep Sky Stacker, when you shoot with a, a modded or a full spectrum camera, it recommends not to use the camera's uh, white balance information in the EXIF data. And so what we end up with is a very red image. Luckily, that's really easy to correct. We want to put a white balance adjustment above the initial pixel layer that we're working on. So layer new adjustment layer, white balance, and you'll see I've actually set up a shortcut for that because I use it so frequently. Uh, on Mac, I'm using option W. So let's add our white balance adjustment, and I'm going to just slide both the white balance and tint down until we neutralize the, the background. And um, it's very possible that I will need to come back and revisit the white balance once I do some more tone stretching. 
because as we start to stretch the tones even further, we'll bring out more of the reddishness, which we don't want. So another curves adjustment. I'm going to use the picker again, and this time I'm going to just drag and sample here. Now, you don't always have to um, do like a dramatic tonal adjustment. I tend to kind of add this as an anchor point. So it doesn't even have to move from the, the diagonal line going through the curves graph here. What's more important is that I anchor that tonal point, and then that gives me more free reign to push the faint nebula tones away from that background detail. And again, I'm just going to use another node here to tail off the highlights that we're pushing up. Okay, um, I'm thinking at this point then I might add one more curves adjustment, I reckon, because right down here, I don't know if you can see this on the live stream, it's very faint. There's some really faint red nebula detail. So we're gonna try and bring that out. Once again, I'll use my picker, pick off the background there, just anchor that, and then go right into this very faint detail. Oh, look at that. That's very dramatic. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I say, quite dramatic. The, um, the thing we have to be careful of is um, it's very tempting to push uh, our stacked astrophotography images too far, and then we end up with um, kind of meaningless noise in the background. Um, and it might look okay at the moment, but that will come back to bite us later once we do more processing. Um, one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to show you, is how to remove the gradient going across the length of the image. So, although instinctively I probably could take the tones maybe a little bit further, I'm actually probably going to leave it there because, um, you know, surely through um, purely through trial and error. Yeah, it, I just don't want to end up with too much fuzziness or noise in the background detail. So I'm going to go back to my white balance adjustment down here. And I'm just going to neutralize that a little bit more, like so. I'm going to leave a tiny bit of red in there, though. I'm not going to neutralize it entirely. Um, because it brings out some kind of like some nice reddish hue in the, the nebula detail here. And we don't actually have to worry uh, too much about the balance of the sky detail because we're going to remove that anyway. Okay, now before we go on to um, <laughs> the really exciting part, which is the, um, the synthetic flat frame subtraction, we're going to probably do a little bit of denoising, I reckon. Yeah, in fact, before we do that, I lied. I'm actually going to add one more curves adjustment and I'm just going to push this a little bit further, just a tiny bit, like so. I'm actually going to do it manually and by hand this time. Yeah, okay. That works. That works for me. So I'm going to uh, do some denoising now, some luminance and some color denoising. And for that, I'm going to duplicate the background pixel layer. Command J. I'm just going to rename this layer. Let's stay organized here. Um, the reason I'm actually doing this destructively rather than adding it as a live filter layer, because we could add it as a live layer and that would be non-destructive. The reason I'm doing it destructively is because we can be more aggressive, uh, more effective with our noise reduction. And uh, you'll see that I add a clarity filter later as well. I'll get into that again. So let's go to denoise. Uh, move the sliders back. Let's zoom into a particularly noisy patch. Yeah, we can see there. Okay, so I'm gonna drag the color slider up until that color noise disappears. You can see there's the color noise in the background detail. And I can just remove that quite easily, like so. Um, I'm just gonna answer a question from the chat, actually, while I'm here. Um, what lens or telescope did you use? Didn't use a telescope. I used a, um, a Canon 400mm f5.6 lens. Um, want me to get really detailed. With a Sigma MC11 adapter so that I could put it on my Sony A6000. The Sony A6000 is the modded or the full spectrum camera, basically. Um, and because of the crop factor of the APS sensor, um, it becomes, I think, equivalent 600mm. So it was quite a, a reasonably tight 
um, focal length for the Orion Nebula. And to be honest, it's about as far as I can go with the, the star tracker and the equatorial mount that I've got. Um, I think these exposures were 25 seconds long. You can get away with that because the Orion Nebula is such a bright object anyway. Um, but at that focal length, I was, I was struggling really. Um, the only reason I actually managed to get 25 seconds was because I shot this in my back garden and it's nice and protected from the wind as well. Um, I sort of wedged my um, setup between the shed and the fence and it just, get, it just kind of took the edge off the, uh, the wind uh, during the winter period. So anyway, um, where were we? Yeah, luminance noise. Let's tackle that as well. So, okay, I'm just going to... You've got to be careful with this. It's tempting at this point to go, oh yeah, let's just wipe out all of the noise like so. But the problem is once you, you do your flat frame subtraction or your, your synthetic flat frame subtraction, and then you add clarity, you add sharpening and so on, if your image doesn't have any kind of natural texture to it, it really becomes quite obvious and it just it just doesn't have the same appeal or the same clarity to it. So I tend to keep luminance noise reduction at around maybe 15% give or take. So it's just kind of taking the edge off the noise, but not, excuse me, eliminating it entirely. Okay, I'll click apply. And now I think it's time for yeah, I think it's time to create that synthetic flat frame. So what we're going to do is merge all of our changes so far by going to Layer and Merge Visible. Okay, um, what should I call this? Let's just call this Merged. I'm going to copy this layer. So on Mac, that's Command-C. And I'm going to go to Filters and New from Clipboard. Okay. Now I'm going to explain my reasoning behind this. Okay. So I mentioned that um, we're working in 32-bit and we're pretty much going to work 32-bit from start to finish. But there is one filter that we cannot use in 32-bit that we need for this, and that's the median filter. So median operators are um, incredibly expensive um, or um, very um, performance degrading to implement, especially in 32-bit precision. Um, so we can't use it. But what we can do is create a copy of our changes so far, remove the deep sky objects from it, and then run the median filter on a 16-bit version, convert it back to 32-bit and paste it back in to use it. So I'm gonna get the selection brush tool here and I'm just going to make a selection of my deep sky objects. So that's the Orion Nebula, the Running Man. And I've got a bit of a dust spot up here. I'll tell you a funny story about that in a minute. Um, and once I've got my selection, I can just go to Edit and In Paint. It's going to take a, uh, a few seconds. So I'm just going to look at the chat, see if there's anything I can address. No? Okay. Um, I will actually just explain that the reason I haven't used the in-painting brush tool, um, if anyone's experimented with Affinity Photo or you use it already, you probably go straight for the in-painting brush tool, which allows you to paint over areas and remove them. Um, I tend to do a selection instead because you might have multiple um, crucial sort of deep sky objects in your image. They might be sort of uh, dotted around and it's just kind of more economical really to select them all at once um, even if they're apart in the image and then in, in paint them all together. It also means that you don't end up accidentally you sampling one deep sky object when you replace another. That can sometimes happen. Okay so let's deselect using command D and now true to my word if we try and apply a median blur filter we can't do it. It's grayed out because we're in 32-bit. So we can go to document and convert the bit depth using convert format to RGB 16. Okay, let's click convert. And now what this allows us to do is use median. Uh, by the way, an alternative technique, or you, you might have read about is dust and scratches. Essentially they're the same thing. It's basically a median operator. It's just that dust and scratches has a couple of additional options, which we're not actually gonna use here at all. So we may as well just stick with median blur. 
Okay. Uh, it's already actually the slide is already set from when I practiced this earlier. Can you tell? Um, so what we do with median blur is we drag the radius up until we eliminate all of the stars. Okay. And then we click apply. And also, um, I've not experimented with other astrophotography stacking software, so I don't know if it's a common theme. But as part of the stacking process and during the alignment, Deep Sky Stacker, um, the final images have some kind of meaningless information on the very borders of the image. And that's kind of shown through because we're applying a blur. Um, not to worry, all this means is that we basically just have to crop into our final image slightly. So the other thing we might notice is, again, I'm not entirely sure if this will come through on the live stream, but there is some banding present having just run the, um, the median blur. And this actually clears up very nicely if we just convert this document back to 32-bit. Click Convert. Okay, and now I'm going to use Command-C to copy my new layer here. I'm going to close this document down and paste it into my main document. Okay, as you can see, we've got those um, four corners that we need to get rid of. So C for the crop tool, and I'm just gonna drag in from the bottom corners like so, then hit return to commit the crop. Okay, let's call this flat, this layer. Okay, and now we just need to move it underneath the merged pixel layer, because what we're going to do is use a filter called apply image. So, one way is to just drag on the Layers panel, keep your cursor to the left, and you can drag it underneath, like so. I prefer to use keyboard shortcuts to speed up my workflow, so on Mac, that's Command and left square bracket. Then I'm gonna select the merged pixel layer, go to Filters, and Apply Image. Okay, what we can do on this dialog is drag the flat layer onto the dialog, to use it. And then we want to set our blend mode to subtract. Okay, <laughs> so a couple of things to note here. One is that this does effectively remove our gradient because what we did was create like a synthetic um, flat which had the gradient profile. And if we subtract it from the main image, we of course subtract the gradient, fine. Uh, the issue is that it subtracts to pretty much pure black, and this does not look very good at all. Now, if you follow tutorials from um, a certain other piece of image editing software, you might be aware that um, the solution to this is to use an offset slider. We can, you know, don't panic, we can achieve that in Affinity Photo's Apply Image dialog by checking the channel equations and what we can do is add an offset to each channel individually. So for example, um, I might add an offset of 0.1. We use values between 0 and 1. And we can use um, decimal values or floating point values as they're called. Okay, so that will offset the subtraction and uh, it probably looks a bit too bright. So depending on your own imagery, you might have to experiment with this. I've found for this image a value of maybe... 0.03 tends to work quite well. Yeah. I mean, we could probably, uh, we could probably try slightly higher, but I might just go with this value. Um, the great thing, however, about using channel equations is um, let's say you were working with um, an image and you've got quite a lot of, um, you, you photograph something that has a lot of hydrogen alpha emission and you want to retain as much of that red channel information as possible, you can actually add an offset or a bias to one of the color channels. So for example, if I was on the red channel here, I could add 0.04 instead of 0.03, and that would just give my whole image a slight red tint, which is useful if you want to kind of tease out that very faint red detail. We don't really need to do that for the Orion Nebula though. So, I'm just, I'm just trying to evaluate this, so just zoom out. This is also a good little technique, actually. Um, I was going to explore this at the end, but it's quite applicable here as well. Sometimes, to get a better perspective, I find it helps to just zoom your image out and look at it um, in very, a very small uh, rendition. And that might just kind of help you, for example, here, if I try a slightly higher value, 
Yeah, I actually, no, I, yeah, no, I might, yeah. So that's helped me decide that that would be too bright. So I'm going to stick with point zero 0.03 and click apply. Okay, the next step we're going to do is add some clarity or structure enhancement. And um, like I did with Denoise, I'm actually going to duplicate that merged pixel layer and call it clarity. So again, if I wanted to work totally non-destructively, I could add a live filter layer, a live clarity filter. Okay. But the problem is um, there has to be a concession because it, it effectively has to render in real time in the document stack, the layer stack. And so you can't be as aggressive with it. So what I prefer to do instead is actually duplicate and run the destructive clarity filter. Okay, and it will already be set to 100%. There we go. So as I drag up, watch what happens to the texture and the structure of the image. We really start to bring out that very faint nebula detail, especially around there. I mean, that looks really dramatic now. Of course, we don't want it to affect the rest of the image because we're bringing up quite a few dust spots here. Um, and also these stars are perhaps um, uh, they're fighting too much for our attention. So I'm going to click apply. And then what I will do is hold alt or option while I add a mask layer down here. And that adds an empty mask. That then leaves us free to use the paintbrush tool over here. Just increase my brush width. And I just need to make sure I'm painting with white. So on the color panel, you can toggle between these two colors very quickly, or I prefer to use X on the keyboard to toggle. And then I can paint in over the areas. I'll just zoom in so you can see that. Over the areas I want to affect. Of course, we have a problem. It's that dreaded Orion core again that's getting overexposed. So not a problem. We can just use X to flick back to black on the color panel. Didn't mean to name check an album there. And um, then we just paint out from the Orion core like so. Okay, now the other issue that I'm gonna tackle now is I'm gonna do some in-painting or dust spot removal. So um, I'll just see if there's anything I can address in the chat. Da -da 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 -da. Um, no, okay, so basically, when I actually shot this, it was a kind of like a, a spur of the moment decision. I originally was going to do a much wider view of um, uh, the Andromeda galaxy. And then I decided last minute, as you do, no, actually, I, I haven't got anything with um, my modded camera of the Orion Nebula yet. And I want to see if a modded camera can bring out any more nebula detail. So I basically um, changed lenses on the fly, um, set my tracker up again very quickly, polar aligned, all of that. Um, but of course I didn't use a, a rocket blower and the, the, there were so many dust spots on the sensor. Honestly, if you see one of the light frames, there's just dust spots everywhere. Now I shot calibration frames, I shot darks, I shot flats, I shot bias, I shot dark flats. And on the flats, you can see all the dust spots very clearly. But in a way, it's almost um, the flat frame <laughs> calibration, um, the uh, division, I think, or subtraction. Um, it's actually kind of inverted the dust spots. So now they appear as like these, these blobs. Um, so this is just one example of what can go wrong when you do this kind of astrophotography. So I'm going to in-paint non-destructively. And for that, I'm gonna create a pixel layer down here. And then with my in-painting brush tool, what I can do is on the context toolbar up here, I can change this option to current layer and below. And you can do this for all the retouching tools in Affinity Photo. So now I've got my blank pixel layer, but if I use my in-painting brush, in fact, although this is nice, I'm gonna get rid of it anyway, because um, I don't want too much kind of fighting for attention. I've got a kind of like a red smear up here that I'm gonna also get rid of. And I'm just gonna sort of browse through the image. Yep, I've got a very faint dust spot there. And you can kind of see them here. They're, um, they kind of disturb the noise profile in the image. These are really bad, look at these. Okay, so we're just going to in-paint these out. So anyway, back to my point about non-destructive in-painting. 
essentially um, what we can do is inpaint and sample from the layers beneath the layer we're inpainting onto. So as I am inpainting, like so, just see if there are any more. There's a couple down here. Although I'm probably being a little bit picky now. Yeah, okay. So basically we've got this pixel layer. Let's rename it again to stay organized for this session. Um, if I isolate that layer by holding option and clicking on it, you can see all of the in-painting work that I've done, but it's on a separate pixel layer. So we haven't had to merge our changes once again and then do some more in-painting on it uh, destructively, that type of thing. And it means that, excuse me, if we, um, if we ever had a scenario where we needed to go in and erase some of that in-painting, we could do that very easily. I've just spotted <laughs> Another dust spot up here. I'm trying not to be too perfectionist about this at the moment. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do is use channels. And for this, I'm actually going to merge our changes again. Okay, um, this layer I'm just going to call temp for temporary. Uh, we, we won't end up using it for anything else really. And I've got my channels panel open down here. And what I can do is extract one of my color channels as a grayscale layer. So what I will do is right click red and create a grayscale layer from it. Okay, let's just call this red. And then I can set the blend mode to luminosity. And it will blend through uh, the luminosity of that red channel information from its grayscale form. So what this does, if I just zoom in is it's, it's very subtle, but it just kind of, again, it's all of these little things that you kind of build up to produce the final image. So if I turn it on, you can just see some of that very faint nebula detail becomes ever so slightly more visible. Now the problem is because we've added luminosity, we've also desaturated, so we need to take care of that. Don't worry, we'll get around to that. Um, the other issue, <laughs> going back to the Orion core again, is that we're now clipping the Orion core, if you can see right in there, it looks a bit ugly, it just clips to kind of flat white. So to counteract this, I will add a mask layer, get my paintbrush tool, and I'm already set to black, that's good. I can just subtract away from the mask and get my nice punchy white Orion core back. Okay. So I mentioned um, tackling the saturation, and that is exactly what we will do. I'll add an HSL adjustment. Now you can do this from the layer, new adjustment layer menu, or you can use the shortcut. So I'm gonna use Command U on Mac or Control U on Windows. And I don't have any specific color regions I want to avoid. So actually, I'm gonna stick with my master option here and just bring the saturation up like so, until we just add back in that nice richness of color that we lost by doing the luminosity blend mode on that grayscale layer. We've got some blue hiding in here as well. So the next step is um, astrophotography purists will probably start yelling at their screen in a moment. Um, I, I do this with all my kind of, uh, all my genres of photography. I like to enhance regions or tones using brushwork and astrophotography is no exception. So I'm gonna add a blank pixel layer. Uh, let's call this painting. Get the paintbrush tool, uh, just increase my brush width and I'm gonna hold Alt or Option and click drag to bring up my color picker. I'm gonna sample from a nice sort of rich purplish color, a purpley red color on the Orion Nebula here, then release the mouse button and that becomes my active color on the color panel as you can see up here. I'm gonna tweak this slightly to make it a little bit deeper. Then on my pixel layer, I'm gonna set the blend mode to overlay. Okay, now if I brush over at the moment, you can see that effect is gonna be way too strong. Um, it's gonna take our nice astrophotography image from looking quite nice and pleasing to just looking completely comical, which of course we want to avoid. So we can take the opacity down, 
maybe to about, let's try 50%. I mean, this is the great thing about working with layers is that if the effect is too strong or if it's too weak, it's not a problem. We can just go back in and adjust the effect. I'm already thinking this is too strong, but we will persevere for now. We've got some very subtle shades of blue and um, light purple up here. Let's see if we can't enhance those. So on my color panel here, I've got the HSL wheel. I'm just going to see if I can add a little bit more color to these areas. Again, this is so subtle, so, so subtle. Let's zoom out and get some perspective. <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, straight away, this looks far too strong. Not a problem, let's just take the opacity down and we can scrub the opacity slider so we get a real-time preview of the result that we might want to end up with. I'm thinking maybe just shy of 25%, something like that. That might look quite nice, yeah? Okay, um, also, just up here, just switch back to my brush tool. Let's pick a nice deep blue and see if we can't just enhance the blue up here as well. Again, I mean, we're, we're just talking very faint differences here. Here's the before and the after. Okay, looking good so far. We're pretty much coming to a close for the edits that I wanted to make on this image. Um, one thing you can do, rather than constantly use curves adjustments, is sometimes a simple brightness and contrast adjustment will suffice. We'll try that here. So let's add a brightness and contrast adjustment. And I'll just increase the brightness and the contrast, like so. And again, if I just show the before and the after, it just adds a nice little bit of glow, a little bit of punch to the nebula detail here. In fact, why don't we take this a little bit further, like so. Okay. Now, <laughs> if this wasn't nerdy enough already, we're about to go into super nerd territory. Are you ready for this? Okay. So I'm going to add a non-destructive unsharp mask filter. Uh, this is for our final output sharpening. But watch what happens. If I have a radius of two pixels and a factor of two, we get these horrible black halos around all of our star detail. Now, granted, it's probably less noticeable at 100% zoom. I am exaggerating this because I'm near 600% zoom. But this is because we are compositing in linear space. So... As opposed to working in 8-bit or 16-bit, when we work in 32-bit unbounded floating point precision, we composite in linear gamma, okay? Um, whereas when we're in 8 and 16-bit, all the compositing is done in gamma-corrected nonlinear space. And um, I don't know if you've ever tried to HDR merge your images, then try and add some sharpening afterwards, but you may have seen this. Um, even in kind of like landscape photographs, that type of thing with Affinity Photo. And it's because we're in linear compositing at the moment. Now, previously, what I was doing was I, at this point, I would flatten my document down and I would save a copy of it and convert it to 16-bit just so I could add my final sharpening uh, and that type of thing and maybe do some cropping. And of course, that's not great for an undestructive workflow because you know, you're making another copy of your document. That's an implication for file size storage, that type of thing. And then I found this, just sort of worked out this really cool workaround using the procedural texture filter. Um, so in Affinity Photo, we have a procedural texture filter where you can essentially write functions and equations. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can go quite far down the rabbit hole with this. But essentially what I'm going to do is add a live procedural texture and I want to make sure it's underneath my unsharp mask. I'm just going to turn the unsharp mask off for now. Okay, and take a sip of water. So on the procedural texture dialog, I want to click this plus icon three times. My image goes black, that's fine. This is for red, green, and blue. And what I want to do is 
this harks back to uh, secondary school mathematics. I'm going to raise each color channel, so R, to the power of 0.45 recurring. We won't bother with the recurring, we'll just repeat the, uh, the two digits twice. Do the same for green and the same for blue. Now, if anyone has studied uh, linear versus nonlinear gamma transforms, that type of thing, and compositing, um, you're, you're probably screaming at the screen right now saying, that's not technically accurate. Um, you can't just apply one, you know, the, uh, the power transform is kind of like a median value. It's not absolute across the entire tonal range, etc. But this is close enough. And what we're doing here is you'll notice our entire image has uh, become much brighter and washed out. And what we're doing is we can now composite the unsharp mask in nonlinear gamma corrected space or a rough approximation of that. So if we have a look at our stars around here, notice that the, um, if I turn unsharp mask on, there's some slight kind of black edge to the, the, the detail here, but it's nowhere near as pronounced as it was previously. Let me just turn procedural texture off so you can see the before and the after. Look at that. And in fact, it even gives our stars a bit more of a punch and glow, which is kind of an unintended, unintended side effect, really. So now all we need to do is get back to our original linear space. And for that, we're going to add another procedural texture filter on top of the unsharp mask. And then add our three equation channels again. And this time we're going to raise each channel to the power of 2.2. Okay, why 2.2? Because 2.2 is the reciprocal value of 0.45 recurring. Uh, to calculate this, we can just do one over 0.45. And there we go, we get 2.2 recurring. And that's how you work out reciprocal power values if you wanted to try this yourself. <laughs> okay, so we can close that down now. And I'm just going to command select to choose both of these procedural texture layers. And I'm going to turn them off. And you're going to see the before, look at that, with those black halos, and the after. So we've pretty much gotten rid of those uh, nasty, distracting black halos around our star detail. So that's a great little tip because it now means that you can do your entire image start to finish in 32-bit, and that's really useful. And I appreciate that's, you know, <laughs> quite time-consuming and perhaps a little bit daunting if um, you haven't done that type of thing before. So I'm going to go ahead and delete all them. And if you follow the link in the description of this video, you will find the free astrophotography macro pack that I've provided. So if you import that into your macros library, you've got all kinds of options here. You've got star motion deconvolution. That's really useful for images where um, your exposure time was maybe slightly over what it should have been, and you've got slight star trails. Um, and, but also you've got nonlinear and sharp mask. And if I add that, that basically does the entire procedure that I just showed you within a macro. You can see I've got my sharpening back here. So you don't have to worry about getting the values right, getting the equations right, all the rest of it. You can just download these macros and run the nonlinear unsharp mask. What you can also do is if I just go beneath here, I've got a nonlinear compositing macro. And that sets it up so that all you need to do is put whatever adjustment layer or pixel layer in between these two layers, and that will be composited in gamma corrected nonlinear space. The reason you might want to do this is, um, I don't know if you've ever tried to use curves in 32-bit. Um, you might have done if you've um, merged any bracketed exposures together for HDR, but curves seems incredibly sensitive. And that's because a lot of the, um, the curves detail is going to be in the first half of your histogram here. Well, if you're in nonlinear space, you should find that it's far less sensitive and it's perhaps a little bit easier to push the tones around and manipulate them. Okay, I'm going to hide my library panel. 
Now that's my main image finished. I've actually decided I don't like that curves adjustment. So I'm going to delete that, get back to my original uh, tonal look. Now, the final thing I want to do is rotate this image. So I'm just going to give you a bit more of a boring backstory. If I had followed the right ascension and the declination of my star tracker at the time, I would have ended up with the more typical composition you have for the Orion Nebula and the Running Man, which is they're side by side on the left and right. But I was a little bit cheeky and I rotated my camera and lens within the tripod collar so that I was shooting purely horizontal landscape. Um, and it's ended up with the Running Man on top here. And to be honest, I don't really like that composition. I prefer the side by side. So all I do is go to document, rotate anti-clockwise, get my crop tool and just crop in like so. And there is my finished astrophotography image. But of course, regardless of what genre of photography you're editing or whether you're compositing, I would always recommend zooming out, you know, coming back, uh, going to make a cup of tea or whatever your preferred beverage is, coming back with a fresh set of eyes and new perspective on it. Uh, export your images to your phones, your tablets, um, any other kind of medium, perhaps a TV. Look at it on there because you'll get a different perspective and it will help you gauge whether you want to come back and change anything at a later date. I might look at this later and go, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, it's um, maybe the background is too bright or maybe it's too dark, you know. So I would always recommend to try and gain yourself a fresh perspective rather than just exporting here and now and saying it's done. Okay. Thank you very much for watching the session, but I am just going to show you a little bit of a bonus if you're prepared to stick with me. So at the very beginning of this, I mentioned I previously did some Polaris star trails. That was about two and a half years ago. And of course, um, with the lockdown in the UK, at least, we've kind of been stuck and I haven't been able to go out during the night and shoot my astrophotography that I want to. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just make do with what I've got. And I set up everything in my garden and got some Polaris star trails about last week. So for doing that type of photography, you can also use Affinity Photo um, to very quickly get your stack into a document. You go to File and New Stack. You add your images in here. You don't need to align them because you will have shot them on a tripod for long exposure. You uncheck that and then you click OK. And what it does is it gives you a document with a live stack group. And all you do is you click here and you change the operator to maximum. OK. And that blends through all of the brightest pixel layers, which of course will be the star trails in our imagery here. But you know, I'm not gonna stop there <laughs> because why would I? Let's take this a little bit further. Okay, so again, um, astrophotography purists are probably gonna get very upset with me. As you may, or may not, you may or may not know, but the actual Polaris star is not actually um, on the, the axis of the Earth's rotation. It's ever so slightly offset. And of course, that means that it does move very slightly. So when you stack together exposures over, say, an hour or two hours, you've also got the Polaris star that moves as well. And I don't like that compositionally. I want a nice, sharp star bang in the middle of all my um, spiraling stars here. So I'm going to go to the very first exposure in my stack duplicate it and I'm going to bring it out on top like so. There's my nice Polaris star that's very sharp. Get the elliptical marquee tool and I'm going to hold shift while I make a selection. I can move it around after the fact as well if I haven't quite got the selection dead on. Okay and then I'm going to invert the pixel selection. I'm not going to bother being non-destructive here, to be honest, and masking it, because we only really need the star from this layer. We don't need the rest of the layer contents. So delete. OK, uh, Command D to deselect, then V to get the move tool. And I'm just going to move this into the center roughly here. OK, and then we need to get rid of the trailing Polaris star here. So I'm going to use that same in-painting technique I showed you earlier. New pixel layer, the in-painting brush tool, and set to current layer and below. 
make my brush smaller and I'm just going to in paint over the Polaris trail. <laughs> Sometimes this happens, it samples from an adjacent area and you get this. Uh, just go over it again. If it, do, if it absolutely refuses to sample from a blank area of the sky, you can use the clone brush tool located here and you can do exactly the same procedure. So set it to current layer and below, okay? So next, this is, um, <laughs> this is one of the very unique things about Affinity Photo that I really do love. Um, I want to add some radial blur to these star trails because if we zoom in, we'll see they're quite jagged and I want more of a kind of a smoother appearance. So I'm going to add, excuse me, a live radial blur. Okay, that's nothing new. You've seen the live filter layers before. And I'm gonna ch check Preserve Alpha. But the great thing about the radial blur filter and all of the filters in photo is that essentially you get feedback on your full resolution document on your screen. So there are no kind of like mini thumbnail previews or like abstract representations of your image. You see the effects happening on the image. So if I drag angle up, instantly I can get feedback on how far I want to go with my radius angle. I can drag around on the canvas as well to move the origin point of my radial blur. Um, <laughs> I've got a bit of a job actually finding Polaris like this. So I'm gonna take the angle down, there we go zoom in and just drag it over Polaris, like so. I think I actually just missed that, there we go. And now I can drag my angle up to get my preferred degree of radial blur. Okay, that looks really nice and slick, but of course, because it's a live filter layer, I can go in, double click it, and change it later if I want to, okay? Uh, what should I do? Additionally, I think I might add a curves adjustment. So again, I'll use my shortcut for that. Command M. Let's just bring these tones down and then up like so. I might add a live clarity. So layer, new live filter layer, sharpen and clarity. And this will just help bring out some of those fainter star trails. I don't know if you can see that, but I'll just zoom in. So let me show you the before here and the after. So it just helps kind of thicken up the composition a little bit by revealing some more of that fainter star detail. Okay, uh, you know what? Finally, let's add a brightness and contrast adjustment. I'm gonna use my shortcut for this. So option B, just to add a, a little bit more punch to this image. And finally, it's probably too strong in the color for my tastes, so. Command U for an HSL adjustment. Drop the saturation down slightly like so. Okay, and there is my finished Polaris Star Trail composition. Actually, hmm, not quite finished. I think perhaps it's a little bit too bright. So let me just go in, add a bit more contrast, less brightness. There we go. Okay, finished, hands off. I'm happy with that. Uh, by the way, I will just mention, because I have been using them throughout, if you go to Preferences, you can on this dialog, set up your own keyboard shortcuts. So um, I do this all the time, especially for, I do a lot of compositing um, and that type of thing. So for example, on layer over here, I will shortcut some additional adjustment layers as well. And also this is really useful if you, um, if you like to clip layers inside other layers. So if you do a lot of compositing work, you wanna put adjustment layers inside your composite pixels, that type of thing, your cutouts, uh, check out the Arrange dialog, and Insertion Inside, that one there. Um, because essentially what that does is it allows you to use your shortcut, so Shift-I, and then when you add your next layer, like a Curves, it gets added, as you can see here, into the layer that you just had selected. So that's a really quick way of quickly clipping layers inside other layers. Just wanted to share that technique with you because I use it all the time for uh, not just compositing, but um, all kinds of workflows, basically. Okay, and I really will bring it to a close now. So thank you so much. I appreciate you all coming and watching this live stream. I hope you're all okay and safe during this ridiculous time, <laughs> crazy time. Um, thank you so much for watching and take care, all of you. Stay safe. Thank you.